This is uh, Jerry Bogle from Avon Lake Public Library. I'm here with another installment of Read Write Local Unbound, where every Tuesday this summer we have an author to talk about what they do and how they do it. This week, our guest is Takana Zhu, who is, hello. Uh, hello, there she is. And uh, she writes um, uh, books about a lot of fantasy stuff about maybe what a real Chinese princess would be like. And she's reached into other areas as well. But rather than me try to imagine what she's going to say, I'll just let her introduce herself. Hello, welcome, good evening. Hi, Jerry. Thank you very much for inviting me to read Write Local. Mm -hmm. um, as you said, my name is Takana. I do write a lot of fantasy uh, fiction. Um, the book that I have coming out on August 14th is actually a little bit outside of my comfort zone. There is fantasy in there, but it's primarily a Asian historical fiction and it takes place in ancient China. Um, so as you said, this is how I felt an Asian princess should behave. Now, a little backstory about how I started writing this book. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with the song Princess of China by Chris Martin and Rihanna, but the song I think is great. But if anybody watched the music video- it's The video um, that you thought was a bit too chop socky, right? <laughs> Yes, it was a video, and I did not think that is how a Chinese princess or princess of China, so to speak, should behave. So just kind of like on a whim, I didn't even intend to finish it. I started writing a short story, and the short story was supposed to encompass, you know, all the um, Chinese soap operas and serials I grew up watching, you know, like the wuxia stories, which are, you know, based on hero heroism and martial arts and, and honor and nobleness and, and Chinese princesses and how they should behave. And it just really started taking off and evolved. And obviously it's no longer a short story. It is uh, two novels. Um, I did finish writing it as one novel, but it was like 500 pages long. So it was recommended that I break it up into two parts. And part one is coming out very soon. This is what it looks like. Dynasty of Summer part one. Okay, good. Yes. We'll be looking forward to that in the very near future. And then when are you looking at uh, part two coming out? Will it be later this year or next year? It'll be next year. Um, the release dates I picked are August 14th for this year and August 4th for next year. And, and since we're talking about fantasy, I can share with you a Chinese myth. There is this myth called, um, well, actually, yeah, there's a story. It's about the cow herder and the weaver girl and the holiday is called Xi Xi. Um, uh, there's like, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out where to start. There is a constellation in the sky and it's seven stars, and those are called the seven goddess sisters. And each of them are prescribed a certain duty to perform. One of them is the weaver girl, and her job is to weave clouds so they can carry water and you know, replenish the earth when it's supposed to. And a story goes, these seven sisters from this constellation, they like to bathe at this gorgeous spring down on earth. And there is a young man, he is a cow herder, and he, uh, is in a not so friendly family situation where his mother dies and his father takes on a, a new wife and she doesn't like him. So she tells him, here are nine cows. You are to go off into the mountains and you can't come back until there are 10. Now, the problem is, if I remember correctly, they were all male cows, yeah. or they were all bulls. <laughs> <laughs> they were either all bulls or they were all female. So there's no way for him to come home with an extra cow. Um, but as he's wandering around, he stumbles upon this spring and, um, oh, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. He actually found a cave where there was a magic blue bowl inside and he helped heal this magic blue bowl. And there's different versions on how, and this magic blue bowl wanted to repay him and help him, you know, start his own family. So the only place where he, this magic bowl knew women went to were these goddesses that bathed in the spring. So, <laughs> I mean, this bowl isn't you know, from earth uh, as, you, as um, some versions explain. And when the cowherd gets there, he steals the outfits of one of the girls because he's never seen clothes that beautiful before. And lo and behold, you know, all the sisters, when they fly back off to heaven to do their chores, the youngest sister can't find her clothes and she's gone looking for them, these super long robes. And that's how they meet and they get married and they have their own family. Um, but of course, without anybody in the heavens weaving the clouds for water, the earth becomes scorched and the, the ruler of heaven, there's the heavenly mother, some say it's the great king of heaven, comes down and brings the weaver girl home. And of course, um, 
the cowherd is pretty upset because you know his wife had to leave so this part's a little bit sad the magic bowl says that his life is nearing his end and once he dies he asks the cowherder to take his skin and make these magic shoes so he can walk up to heaven that's that's one version that's the version i most commonly see and so that happens and he's rejoined with his wife in the heavens i'm sorry this is getting really long I promise we'll talk more about my books later. Um, but this mythology pretty much, uh, they had to be separated again because once again, she wasn't weaving the clouds for the rainwater. And so the great mother of heaven cast the Milky Way, that this was the creation of the Milky Way. And he was forced to sit on one side and she was supposed to sit on the other side. But one day a year, they're allowed to see each other and there's a bridge that forms. Some say it's by magpies, some say it's a rainbow. Um, and that's the one day you're allowed, they're allowed to see each other. And that is the seventh day of the seventh month on the lunar calendar. And that is the day that my book is releasing <laughs> for this year is August 14th. And then next year I'm releasing part two on the same holiday and it falls on August 4th. So there's, that's your explanation of the release dates and why we yes. got to wait so long for season two. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, always sorry, I, I had to kind of ramble. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk more about you. Let's talk about you as a child. Um, if I can recall, you grew up reading all kinds of books and mm -hmm. you said something about the, I guess you spent some time at the Richmond Heights Library. Yes, mm -hmm. the, the elementary school's library, yes. yes. Uh, in, um, in Richmond Heights, okay. All right. I, I cannot remember the librarian's name, but I know that uh, my class was a pretty diverse class and I think that inspired her to speak out um, children's books from diverse backgrounds. And I, I recently started collecting them, you know, whenever I get bored or, you know, I wake up at four o'clock in the morning, which every writer does when inspiration, you know, strikes. And as they try to fall back to sleep, they're Googling things that inspired them in the past. And I found myself, you know, looking for discount copies of my favorite books. Since, um, since then I've collected, you know, The Girl Who Lost Her Hair, The Rough Face Girl. Uh, there's a Greek one about a girl that tries to tame her fate. Um, books about Anansi, a Native American spider. Uh, I think it's Mufaro's Beautiful Daughters is another one. It's a story about, it's, it's like a Cinderella story. There's two mean sisters and one benevolent sister and she ends up getting the prince in the end. Um, and there's, there's a few more. And the Firebird was another one. I think that one is Eastern European. So I, yes. Yeah, so reading stories from different backgrounds, especially, you know, the power of the myth and just you know, the lesson in the story, I think is very important for children and not just children, but you know, they're stories we carry into adulthood and it's important to share these belief systems, you know, the, the benevolence in the stories to move forward. A lot of these things, yes, they're folk, they're folk tales. Uh, sometimes they're warnings for children. Other times it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's life lessons, it, it's values that, that we're passing on this way. And, they mutate and turn into strange things and i guess you've taken a lot of that inspiration for the stories you've written yourself mm -hmm. absolutely um i know in dynasty of summer itself i did mention some of the popular tales as well as some of the history that's bordering on myth like the first king of china king or emperor i think it's king it's before the first emperor because that's Qing Shi Huangdi. Mm -hmm. yes uh, would you like to hear another half myth sort of history? <laughs> uh, yes. Um, so as this story goes, there, there was a king of, of a part of China because Asia is, is still, you know, developing at this point. This is over, over 2000 years ago, at least. And the story is about a man, his name is Yu the Great, spelled Y-U. And basically there was a lot of flooding in China. Uh, there still was until they, they built that big dam just a few decades ago. Um, and the king was trying to hire this engineer to deal with the flooding problem, and he did not succeed. But his son, who is named Yu, actually did succeed. And as a reward, the king passed on the throne to him when he passed away. And, you know, back then it wasn't done through bloodlines. It was done through whoever was qualified for the job or did something to earn it. And Yu the Great is still revered there's a statue of him um well there's many statues of him i was thinking about the very large one but i right now i can't remember what city it's in um but he was seen as the first uh, leader of china before the emperors and this is during the Xia dynasty 
or the start of the Shah dynasty, which uh, loosely, if you look at the character itself, it translates into the word for summer, which leads me to this story, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Dynasty of Summer. So when I first started writing this book, I wasn't really sure what part of Chinese history to set it in because it's like thousands of years, it could be anywhere. Um, but when I actually sat down and I was trying to think of my favorite parts of Chinese history, it was like all over the place. So ultimately I settled on the Shao dynasty, which was the first dynasty because it is very poorly documented. And of course I use literary license. Um, I think most people like the story. You know, I think the only group that would not like it are Chinese historians because they're like, this doesn't belong here. <laughs> you know, I did break some rules when it comes to time. And that's why I, I try to bring this old uh, forgotten, well, it's not forgotten, it's poorly documented dynasty to life. So, I say poorly documented because I think there's only two lines that reference it by Confucius in his bamboo analects. And uh, I think it was 2011, they finally found some rammed earth walls in a vicinity, um, I, I wanna say it's Sanxi, but I'm not 100% sure because I read this article back in 2011. Uh, so they found some rammed earth walls and carbon dating did put it back during the Shah dynasty. So there is proof that there is civilization and there was, you know, um, developed like cities, states around that time. So there's always the question with history when you're making tales from it is what do we know if we don't know enough? And if we do know, how much liberty can we take with a story just to make it more storyable? Because sometimes history is so complicated or makes no sense. <laughs> There's no story there, but, but you know, like you can't make this stuff up. So sometimes you have to take some license, I guess, right? Yes, absolutely. And I, I explain why sort of, you know, because I have things that were in like later parts of Chinese history that I put during this dynasty. And at the end of part two, I do kind of explain how that could possibly work. And I don't want to, you know, spoil it. So I guess you'll have to read part two next year. Okay. Now, I guess as you kept growing up, you kept reading more, you know, sophisticated, moving, imagine, like you read a lot of books about people under difficult circumstances, you were telling me. Like mm -hmm. people went through tragedies, people went through, uh, you know, disasters, like the Trail of Tears, like a, like a book about an air crash you mentioned once too, that stayed. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I think one of the most important, the two most impressionable books I ever read as I was starting to get older and I was in middle school. One of them is, um, the, uh, it was about the Trail of Tears. I can't remember what it's called. And I think I was 11 or 12 and this book completely caught me off guard. Like, uh, it was very realistic. It was in the middle grade section because the girl I think was like 12 or 13 years old. Um, and basically I can't, I can't remember much about the story because it's been a long time, but she, it, describes her being kidnapped and uh, somewhere along the way as she's marching along the Trail of Tears and she's sold as a servant or into slavery essentially. Um, I just remember vividly like the person, there's this old woman she was sold to that was like biting on the gold coin and that's the first time I've ever read anywhere that you know you have to bite gold to see if, it bends, to see if it's real. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those stories where you're you're hoping for some kind of satisfaction like, like something positive in the end or and some there take is there, there wasn't. It absolutely wasn't. It was. It was more like a, a. I don't know how true it is because you know. I think it'd be very hard to follow the story of this one girl, mm -hmm. especially since I don't think people really cared about documenting their stories back then. But yeah, it was fiction. But I think that um, it was written like a documentary in the perspective of somebody who just did not win in the end. And I think, you know, that was the first story that I read that that was like that, where there wasn't something that wrapped up nicely. It left you with a feeling of loss. And I, I think that was the author's intent. Um, and I, it just surprised me that I never read anything like that until middle school. I mean, I, I can kind of understand that, you know, you don't want children to really be exposed to that. But at the same time, it's something that should be talked about, even if it's like baby steps. So I feel you like- You can't shove these about, things that happened in history under the rug and just pretend everything's happy. So terrible wrongs have been done to people, not only in our country, but elsewhere. And it's probably better to find out more about them than forget about them. Yeah. I mean, uh, as children, you just tell them stranger danger. Don't talk to people. You don't know if they're going to hurt you or not, but they don't tell you, you know, why or what could be done. And I mean, there, uh, of course, you want to protect children to some degree, but there's a point where these hard truths should slowly be peeled back to see what's there. 
Um, and the other book that really left an impression on me, I was a little bit older. And uh, the author is Carolyn B. Cooney. And this, this lady has written so many books. I love so many of her books. Uh, another one of my favorite of her books is called Goddess of Yesterday. And I just recently thought of that because it's really good. But um, this book was called Flight something. I think it was like 411. 411, yeah, Flight 411 is down, something like that. Yes. And it it didn't really have an ending per se, um, like like how you normally think of a, a story that gets wrapped up nicely. Now this book just told the perspective of different people. You had the victims on the plane crash. They they talked. She talked about like you know at least four to five different characters there. But they all had their own stories. One was an addict that had run away to California, and she was on her way back to be reunited with her family. Um, you had the story about the girl that lived on this large estate where the, the plane crash happened. And she was, she was a very relatable character. She was like kind of just shut, and shut in, a little bit shy. She was a little bit heavier um, and it was hard for her to make friends. And then you have the story of the EMS workers and some of them were her classmates. Um, and, you know, some of them were just there to help out. Then you have the story, which was really hard to read of the people at the airport waiting for their families on that flight and how they're handling it. Um, and I, if I remember correctly, one of the characters, you know, there were two brothers sitting next to each other. One of them was in really bad shape and they were just completely separated. One brother was fine and one was like on the edge of passing out. And I, I can't remember what happens to them. I think the author purposely just kind of like maybe implied that he died. I, I can't remember, but I remember always wondering what happened to him. Um, but the story, it resolved when the crash was more or less cleared up. So it just told the story about that span of events and all the people involved. But it, again, it didn't really wrap up traditionally like the way you think a story where there wasn't like, you know, something for the author to tell you that you should take away. There was just a sense of, wow, I just experienced the trauma. Well, okay, not literally, but you know, I just got a view into the trauma of all these people from different perspectives and different reasons. And I think that uh, it, it's important to consider how somebody else might be having a really crappy day. And if you can imagine that, you know, they might've experienced something like in this book, it allows for more empathy. I think that's the point of a lot of these books for children is to get them their empathetic muscles and walking in other people's shoes going. And I think also that what you've described, these stories about an actual historical event and also an imaginary historical event, uh, really, uh, it's kind of like you said earlier, they, they're trying, you're trying to make a story out of this thing when sometimes there is no story, it just starts and it ends. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's really about the journey. <laughs> it's about, about the journey. Yeah. <laughs> so let's go back to your journey a bit now. You're probably in high school now and you're, um, I'm just trying to think what what is it that, that are you continuing to journal and, and, and do all these sorts of things and you actually written any short stories or other things at that time. Um, well, when I was eight years old I started journaling mm -hmm. and I would write short stories in my journal and they will never see the light of day because they're really bad. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, of course, I had a few vampire ones in there I had a spy one I think all I remember was that one was more about a green dress. Um, but I think I was in high school, I was 13 or 14. I started working on this um, fantasy science fiction story. And I haven't come up with a title yet, but the temporary title is The Rose Phoenix. And it is based on um, Asian mythology. Again, the main characters, they, they have these codenames in sci-fi, they're in like this uh, division and it's Phoenix Dragon and Kirin. Kirin is also called Shiling, depending on if you're using Japanese or Chinese. I, I'm Chinese, yes, but I choose to use the Japanese writing Kirin because I think it might be easier for people in the Western culture to pronounce than Shiling, which is spelled with a Q, mm -hmm. the cause of confusion. Um, and this story, I've like <laughs> rebooted it like 10 times at least, um, which is only natural, I guess, as, as you grow as a writer and there's things you wanna add and things that, you know, just ideas that just don't really stand the test of time, you kind of rework them a little bit. But at the core of this, it is about um, the main character is Phoenix. She's a Chinese American young lady. I mean, obviously that's what I should write about, right? And it's about her coming into this power that she 
doesn't really understand and is kind of thrust upon her like every standard you know call to action story but the difference is instead of doing things like she should be battling forward because she's in like a battle division um it is about every time she uses an awesome power she loses a part of herself to the universe and it isn't about fading away it's about becoming one with with all of nature, all of the universe and all the people around her. And I guess it's a little bit, you know, kind of, um, is that Zen Buddhism? I'm not hundred percent sure. It, is it about a philosophy about um, becoming one with the universe and your surrounding? And you're losing it's, uh, chunks of it, you're gaining chunks of it sort of thing. Yes, hmm. yes, exactly. You're losing chunks of yourself, you're trading them for chunks of everything else. <laughs> right, and it's, it's about, um, uh, the principle of, you know, you can't really hold on to anything because it's all temporary. It's about, you know, melding into like, you know, you and I really aren't separate after death. We're all returning to this ethereal kind of um, dimension. Mm -hmm. There's there's different ways to interpret this. <laughs> and I'm not going to say I'm like 100% a spiritualist or that I completely believe there is life after death, but it's something that I really like thinking is a real possibility. But the scientific, obviously, I write sci-fi. I, I do have a logical side of me. That side of me wants to see solid proof, and I want to be able to analyze the solid proof. But until I can, I'm just going to write about certain theories and make it fun to read. So there's always and this, a, yeah, there's always got to be something in science fiction that maybe you take a little leap, uh, mm -hmm. even if the rest of it's grounded. Of course, fantasy, you know, you can do whatever you want, but <laughs> not not infinitely yeah. uh, magical powers because then it's no fun. It's there has to be limits on something, right? Right, exactly. Like fantasy. I wrote this children's book about a little fairy that flies on clouds. Yes. With the arrow. Yes. I remember you were talking the story about the uh, with the arrows uh, into the, the stars. Yes. Yes. Hmm. Would you like to hear a little bit about this beautifully illustrated book? Yes. And it, if I understand correctly, you illustrated this book, correct? I did not. Oh. Uh, my, friend, my friend Margaret did. She went to the Cleveland Institute of Art. She is a much better illustrator than me. <laughs> but you are an illustrator. You do a certain amount of this stuff. But you also told I, me the I main, thing, main thing is you're a choreographer. Yes, I am a choreographer. And Takana Zoo is my pen name because if I were to use my real name, people would think that I am always writing about dancing because I have been doing it for the majority of my life. Mm -hmm. And that is something I'm purposely trying to break away from. We got it. Anyway, yes. back to your story, <laughs> um, the book. Why don't you share uh, some of this uh, adventure with us? Yes. All right. So the main character is a little fairy. Her name is Suna, and she has an older sister named Lina. Actually, she has a bunch of sisters. And her favorite things to do are playing board games like Go with her sister. She likes to race on clouds, these Nimbus clouds. And she loves to shoot stars because every time a star falls from the heavens, a human gets to make a wish. And she adores humans. Like... I don't know I guess you could say she kind of thinks of them as her pets or she just thinks of them as <laughs> you know fairies obviously would think we're pets or maybe she just adores them because you know they're human and they don't live forever and there's something beautiful in that but she sees that you know they're happy they celebrate but at the same time they can get in disagreements there's famine and you know if the disagreements get really bad they can break out in war and she thinks that she can solve their problems if she shoots down enough stars that the humans can make all the wishes they need and if they had everything they needed they would never disagree and go to war and um, her sister finds her really upset one day because she just kept missing the stars and she tells her that it isn't really up to them the fairies the goddesses to fix the humans problems they are born because they're supposed to figure out their own problems it's you know dealing with hardships dealing with things that are causing disagreements it helps them grow if they can overcome that and it made her feel better. So I'm, I don't want to spoil the rest of it, but that is essentially already half the story. <laughs> but basically, you know, at the end of the book, she goes back to riding on her flying clouds and shooting stars every now and then as well. So, okay. Um, I guess we haven't really talked much about uh, about your your new book, uh, The Dynasty of Summer. Uh, can you just give us a little sketch? I know it's about a, a princess of China, but just a little bit without giving stuff away. Of what yes. we can expect in the book, yes. Uh, it's very different from Three Rays of Heaven's Light. Um, uh, it does overall talk about benevolence, but right at the start of it, the main character, um, her name is Tai Xia, but 
everybody just calls her Summer because that's that's her nickname. There's four siblings in her family. She's Summer. She has a brother named Winter and two sisters named Spring and Autumn. So I thought that was cute. It was, remember, this is supposed to just be a silly shit short story and it just kind of snowballed from there. <laughs> so the story starts off as her and her half brother. She kind of likes him, but he's kind of annoying. They're like, they're teenagers or young teenagers. And she stumbles upon his corpse. That is how the story opens up. Now, Summer is, you know, just what you would expect of a princess. She's a princess. She's spoiled. She's entitled. And she doesn't really want to deal with the things that are less savory in life. So she just wants to live her, live her comfortable lifestyle. And all these things that her brother Winter and her now dead half-brother were trying to warn her about, she thinks they're just trying to scare her. Because, you know, sometimes when you're little kids, you like to kind of scare other little kids so you know you make up stories and she grew up with like cousins kind of teasing her that way but things start to turn really real for her when her mother kind of hints at the fact that her brother may be right and of course her mother doesn't really want to think about these things too much too but uh or you know she doesn't want summer to really think about these things so things really get moving when she's on her way she's a little bit older she's it's, it's been a while since her half-brother dies, and she's on her way to the betro- her betrothed kingdom, and she gets abducted by some people. Um, and before she even realizes what's going on, she gets abducted again by other people who claim they're trying to save her, but she has anxiety because of all the things that's happened. She's not 100% sure if she can trust them. And without giving it too much away, um, I won't talk about the plot, but she does get to explore areas outside of the palace where she's lived and she really blossoms into a person that you can start to like that isn't just completely entitled and and I wouldn't say she's selfish because she does try to be like a benevolent person but just she doesn't turn away from her responsibility and she really starts to come into her own and to take responsibility for her life. She's learning she's growing through these adverse things that are are put out yes. Yes and meanwhile when you're reading this book you can uh, enjoy a ride through ancient China. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I guess in many ways, because of your interest in history, you've been doing research for this book your whole life. Mm-hmm. Um, just like with your other book that we haven't seen the light of. Um, do you enjoy, I, I mean, obviously you do enjoy this, but you're bringing a lot of things to people that they're just not familiar with. And so mm-hmm. I think I think it's great what you're doing. So thank you. Well, thank you. Mm-hmm. I, I do hope people read it. Um, I, you know, it, like you said, research, it's more like accidental research. Uh, I have a really great family in China. And I used to go back almost every summer, or at least every other summer, um, from middle school to like even college, mm-hmm. before I started working full time. And they were very adamant about sharing culture with me. Uh, they would take me to like these historic sites. You know, of course, we would like hire the tour guides that could speak in English and Chinese. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know why my parents did that. I mean, sometimes they just, just stuck with the Chinese speaking tourists to force us to learn the language more and to practice it. But it was great to actually see all these places with history, um, to see like, you know, these buildings that were there way before my great, great, great grandparents were born and to hear stories about them. And in some cases, you know, to see places from movies and, and uh, it just, I, I can't explain it. There's there's just something magical about being in a place of history where, I mean, it's not just China. I've traveled other places in the world, but just standing where people you've read about have stood mm-hmm. is just, I, I, I really can't explain it. I try to capture that feeling in the stories because it's like, it's how I imagine it. And I try to expand it by creating that setting. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I mean, I would be really glad to know, you know, if readers tell me if I've succeeded, succeeded or not. But yeah, it depends on who the readers are, I guess, right? That, that is true. I mean, sometimes it's just like a colorful backdrop for some people, and some people really like that. But yes, this accidental research, I kind of put it through my Americanized filter because, you know, I've been American since I was three years old. And I, I like to think I can think like both cultures, and I'm hoping I can translate that cultural experience properly. Mm-hmm. You know, that whole the magic of an ancient place in China with this story that is. Uh, building on top of like a standard trope and mm-hmm. telling it to a Western audience. 
And, yes. and if anybody wants to know more, I have notes in the back of the book that explain mm -hmm. little things and where they come from. So. Well, I think especially in this day and age, people are used to maybe a generation ago reading stuff about other cultures that sometimes can be somewhat stereotype or or they've got every cliche about a culture in there, but you're, you're bringing out a lot of stuff that people are just not aware of, which, which is great. And, I hope uh, so. Yes, and I just personally, I wanted to relate, I can kind of relate to your personal connection to, to your, where you come from and your culture comes from. I have no relatives from England whatsoever, but the, when I first time I went to London, I just mm -hmm. felt like this is where everything I know came from, like in the <laughs> English language and our civilization as I knew it. Uh, and all the it's places like you walk, it's, it's kind of like that. But yeah. and so it depends on what your culture is in your blood or just what you've absorbed, I suppose. And hopefully people get to absorb this from your perspective. I hope so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. Like a lot of the places where I've wanted to travel, I've read about books. I have this itch to go to Antarctica. I haven't been there. Mm -hmm. um, Madeline Alangel wrote, well, she wrote A Wrinkle in Time, but she wrote another one. One in that uh, series of that family? No, it was it wasn't that series. It was I, it was something about a butterfly flapping his wings and it affects. But you know that saying. It was something from that saying. Chaos but anyway, the whole or something. Yes. Yeah, I can't remember the title of the book, but the main character goes to Antarctica, and the whole thing there's like this whole smuggling ring that she accidentally gets drawn into, or other people had been drawn into, and they thought she was involved. And because of that story and how she described, you know, visiting the penguins and visiting the pyramids in South America, I'm thinking, wow, I would love to do a tour like that someday and just, you know, see the Drake's Passage and everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a book by, I want to say Richard something, it's called The Ghosts Belong to Me. And a part of that story happens in New Orleans. And I just absolutely really want to go to New Orleans because just the way he described the people and the culture and the smells is just and the cemeteries being above ground, it was something I really wanted to see. So you've never, been, gone never been in New Orleans before? Yes, for a few days. I have been in New Orleans. You, have been. Very you got there then, good, okay. Yes, I got there. <laughs> so hopefully my book will inspire people to travel to China or at least someplace in Asia. Yes, indeed. Um, again, I think you mentioned also when I talked to you earlier that your experience in choreography sometimes helps with writing books, just putting many similar things together balancing them out in the right one thing after another. Uh, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, it's obviously very different. I mean, with writing, you you do have to pay attention. Not that in dance you don't, but there's more details in how you portray a thought. And I think that choreography has helped um, in that there's a lot of moving elements. There's everybody in the choreograph, choreograph piece that's moving in a different way. They learn a different way. And if you try to explain something one way too much and it doesn't really work with how somebody understands it, you have to get creative and explain it another way. And that's the same thing. I think it helped me take my editor's critique better because it's, it's my way of thinking, oh, okay, maybe I'm doing that thing where I'm like trying too hard to explain something one way. I need to like open up my mind and try to consider other possibilities or other ways that people will see this. Mm -hmm. um, it, and it, it does help with perspective. It's like, how would this character relate to another character? How would they understand better? Where is there a communication block and how can that problem be resolved? So, and of course the moving parts thing, like you have like something going on over here that you have to come back to and you have something else brewing that needs to have a resolution. It's kind of like the same thing. Like choreography has to tell a story too. You have your first act, second act, third act. You have the different types of music, the different moods, you know, and the different backdrops and setting. And it gets into like the whole set production thing. And yeah, it, it can be similar in that you have to be aware of a lot of things and they have to make sense. They have to relate to each other. But on a level, it another it level, it can't look like a mistake or a random thing. Yes, right. It, it's not like you know the finale of the fireworks, where that's like when you take a bow at the end. You know, where just everything is happening all at once, but it's not cohesive. Mm -hmm. There has to be something that is packaged um, visually for the viewer and the audience. Just as for the reader, you have to take in consideration what it is that they're expecting in the story and how you can make it better and fresher that hasn't been done before. Great. I mean, I've never met an author who's a choreographer too. So I think that's a unique uh, perspective that you bring to that. Thank you. Um, let's talk a bit more about the business of uh, writing. Cause I know sometimes 
people write books, but they never really do these things all by themselves. So you talk about editors, uh, maybe you've got readers looking through your material. How, when you're writing this book, and I know it's taken years to put these things together, uh, are you really keeping track of, of all these details? Are you using the, that choreography script or something? Or you, <laughs> you have, do you have diagrams? Do you have spreadsheets? Or, or you, do you have napkins to write in the back of? Well, you know, I used to make fun of people who took notes and stuff, but I, I have to bite my tongue. I'm gonna eat my words. <laughs> I think there comes a point where you have to make diagrams. Um, I know for another story I've been working on a different pen name, I had a, I had three planets, they all had their own calendars and I had to like draw out their timelines to make sure I didn't make a mistake when I was referencing what was happening when. And my husband's like, nobody's gonna care. That's like an overabundant amount of detail. I'm like, but there is gonna be that one reader that's gonna care and they're gonna catch me and it's gonna be a whole thing. Um, but, but besides that, I think that if you're a human being and you have a life, and if you have a family, if you have a job, if you have to do laundry or dishes, you're going to have to step away from your writing. And sometimes the distraction happens for weeks on end. When that happens, it's very important to have notes. To go know where you mean, left off. Yeah. Yeah. To know where you left off or the things that you remember They're as you're off. you know, doing laundry, you're, you're going to want to like scribble that down so you don't forget it later. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, crap, I forgot. I changed the color of this or that or they're the wrong age, you know, something like that. Um, and of course, like if there's something you're trying to describe, but you don't have a visual for it, like let's say some alien architecture or, you know, some super ancient thing where there's no a picture of, if you can draw or if you know somebody who can draw and they can make you an image of that, it'll help you a lot for, for a lot of people to be able to look at that and to consider what to describe that's important because obviously you're not going to write five paragraphs of a, about like you know a spaceship you about just something you can't even see or visualize yeah <laughs> exactly exactly i mean you, i mean that's another thing for writers is you can't just sit there and you know write out a technical document for your <laughs> for this thing you just have to pick up the highlights and then incorporate them into the experience of a character mm -hmm. and that's how you make it enjoyable for the reader so you, you have people to help you with the illustration, with, with helping you put this together. Um, you obviously have, I hope, a bunch of people, maybe your husband, maybe your friends or your sister who, who read this stuff and give you feedback on it. Yeah. Well, it's in progress. Um, I, for Dynasty of Summer, not so much, but for other things I've worked on, I have worked with three different editors. I learned a lot from each of them, all different things. Mm -hmm. um, they're all great. They're very polite. They, uh, they're very gentle with their critiques, which is always great because, mm -hmm. you know, it's really hard to hear critique about your work. Mm -hmm. um, but it's important to like understand where they're coming from, even if you don't like what they have to say. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it is really important to have other eyes, other brains look at your work. Mm -hmm. And if something, if they say something doesn't feel right, I mean, I know one one author, she would like bombard them with a million questions, but I promise I will not do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, if something doesn't feel right, you should go back and just kind of rethink it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but beta readers are really important. They do, they do offer valuable feedback. Like if they have nothing much to say about your story, maybe it's time to throw that in the back burner and work on something else. <laughs> uh, okay well okay maybe that's kind of harsh maybe rethink it and wonder why there is it not that much to say like is it a completely hackneyed and burned out story um are there too many tropes in there that are just a little too familiar or is it something that's just so foreign and that just so unrelatable that nobody can create like a, a bond with any of the characters or their situations. Like, I mean, ultimately writing is about connecting people, not just author to reader, but different readers. So they can have this shared experience and talk about it with other readers as well. I think largely that's why, you know, stories like Harry Potter are so popular. It's because everybody was reading them and there was something in there for everyone to relate to. Yes, shared enthusiasm versus private escape. Same theory applies to music, movies and TV, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, um, so, now you've got editors. Um, I, I know that your oh, some of your other books uh, under your other name and so on, uh, you have published yourself. Um, how does that work? How did that work for you? Well, uh, I think I was in a very unique position. I have a degree in graphic design and marketing. 
Um, my first internship out of college was with a publishing company that sadly is no longer around, which was when I graduated around the recession. And sadly, that's how a lot of businesses went. Mm -hmm. um, and working with them was very helpful because I learned about, you know, Amazon, the Ingram and all the process. What I didn't really have, and I think they didn't really have either, was a lot of contacts in the publishing industry. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I felt like I had adequate enough knowledge to take a leap and just do it and see how it goes. I did pitch a lot of agents, like most people should. That, that In my opinion, that should be your first try anyway. Um, but I got a few continuations, but ultimately they didn't think my book would be widely read which they didn't say why, I can anticipate why, but speculation never helps. So I decided I either have the choice of continuing pitching and just hoping to like get the jackpot or I can try my hand and do it by myself. And I thought the latter would be more fun. Um, I have all the knowledge, probably not completely up to date, but at least I could do like about average of what's expected to have you, a decent- You've seen product. it before and you can apply your own skills and talents to, to work with that. You had a front row seat, yes. Right. And I can't really blame anybody if it doesn't look the way I don't want it to, <laughs> um, you know, having full control. And it, it isn't so much about needing full control over the design aspects is more. I think I appreciate having having full control over my story. Um, as I mentioned before, like, I don't think Dynasty of Summer is perfect. I think there are little things in there I probably would have done differently. But I think that's largely because I was not listening to my own voice on how I think the sh story should have flowed. I was trying too hard to make an example out of what an editor or two editors was trying to show me. And it just ended up uh, not how I would have done it if I could do it again. So, mm -hmm. which I could probably change it, but I think at this point it's, it, it's decent enough. Nobody's and ever going to be happy with what comes out. It's just happy enough, right? It's just a few paragraphs anyway. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'd be curious to know if the readers would be able to pick out which few paragraphs I wasn't too happy about. Mm. I, I think the tone changed a little bit too. So, but yeah, largely um, I think going it alone is difficult. Is it more difficult than going with a traditional publisher? It's hard to say. I mean, if you get into the big five publishing companies, you're not necessarily guaranteed to have a bestseller and you're still going to have to do a lot of the marketing yourself like you know these interviews and going to book events i mean you're, you're still on your own for a lot of that and ultimately i decided that doing it myself is probably just as big of a risk as you know not making it to a big five publisher or making it and not really getting the result that i want so Yes, yeah, so they, they could fly around the country and throw buffets for everybody and then hold that against the royalties. So <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. Mm -hmm. um, but largely, that, uh, I mean, you know, this is all just stuff that I've read. There's, it's just, sorry, I lost my train of thought. I mean, first of all, the chance of getting into one of the big five publishers is incredibly slim. And then there's also the chance that even if they sign with you, they, you know, delay your publishing your book for years and then any time between you know when they agree to when they actually publish they can change your mind and just not publish anymore or change the people the person who signed you excited about you they can go somewhere else and then you, mm -hmm. then you're an unwanted child <laughs> right right yeah. and and I, I i do like a degree of certainty in my life and even if that certainty um, the certainty is not knowing that whether or not I'm going to, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting backwards. Okay. I do like a degree of certainty in my life. I don't like being strung along to, uh, you know, possibly being told one thing and having it change, which is a high possibility because I, I can understand, you know, how that business works. They're looking for sales. Mm -hmm. And if they no longer feel like your book is going to give their sales, they can drop it at any time. Right. Whereas, you know, if my only certainty is I have a product that I'm satisfied with, but then there's still the uncertainty that I can manage as, you know, what is my final sales as the, at the end of the year, I think I am better off with that. Because, you know, once you have a finished product you're happy with, there's still potential in being able to create more sales. It's not about, you know, trying to make millions in a year, which obviously everybody wants to, but, you know, realistically, it's probably not going to happen. But a lot of these publishers, there's going to be hundreds of books they put out every year that do nothing and uh, are basically... Yeah. It's the same with music, which is kind of my background 20, 30 years ago. It's spaghetti against the wall. <laughs> yeah. It falls down. And it, it's not like these, you know, it, just because you're not published doesn't mean you're, you have a bad story. It's mm -hmm. just, 
it probably wasn't right for the time or it probably didn't really vibe with the editor or agent that was looking at it. And there's nothing wrong with that. It I didn't mean, find I'm the right friends. Right. And I have to tell you, one of my favorite authors is from a small publishing company. I can't remember what, what it's called, but um, I mean, she kind of wrote something that that's probably overdone, which is probably why she didn't find a bigger publisher, but she wrote about elves. And not even like dwarves or any other of the Lord of the Rings cast, but mostly about elves. And I didn't really care to read about elves. It's totally not my thing. I'm not into Lord of the Rings. Um, and it's okay if you are, but uh, it was her voice, like the way she put together her sentences and the way she drew you in with the characters and the context they are in the story. Like her voice was just amazing. Uh, oh, it, it's Leslie Ann Moore, by the way. Um, I think you guys should read her. And it made me actually want to read about elves. So I think that if you make me want to read in a genre I don't care about, you're a pretty good author. So yes, if it's um, all written, then sometimes it doesn't matter what genre it is, you can bring somebody in. Mm -hmm. Right. And so coming back to it, she was published by a very small publisher that I've never heard of before. And I, the only reason I stumbled on her was Amazon advertised her first book to me for free. And that was the only reason I downloaded it. Mm -hmm. um, and of course I bought the rest of her books, of course. And I'm still reading her. <laughs> Whereas, you know, I've read some stories that I didn't find very appealing. Um, now I don't want to talk bad, but no. it, it, these were traditionally, th these were New York Times bestsellers and I gave them a shot because I still occasionally, you know, give traditionally published books a shot. And I, it left a lot to be desired. Um, I mean, the story was unique, but there wasn't anything in there to really make me feel like I was drawn in. And admittedly, was, some of these big authors are coasting on their reputations and they just crank them out. And sometimes they that's possible. write the same book over and over again. And some people like that, but. Uh, <laughs> right. And I'm not saying, you know, that these, these big fives, you know, they just put out lame books. I'm not saying that at all, even though I literally just said it. So uh, I'm just saying that I, as a, you know, because I'm an independently published author, I want to give other independently published authors a chance. And I'm finding that I'm gearing myself more towards indie published books uh, to read for myself when I can read. Um, but, but, you know, it's tough out there. It's, it's hard. It's hard to find something that you can read that you don't find yourself automatically editing in your head. That's probably the biggest challenge is that I can no longer read for leisure. <laughs> yeah, as a reader, there's lots of people shouting for your attention out there in the void. And uh, mm -hmm. I'd like to hope sometimes that libraries can help with that too. Yes, we get the books everybody wants to read, but we're hoping right beside them, you find something else you didn't know you wanted to read. And Absolutely. I do make a point of giving all the independent authors and local authors, especially the chance uh, put mm -hmm. their books right beside everybody else and go, what's this? It's local. Let me try it. And I'm hoping that that makes a difference. I really appreciate that. Hmm. that that's really awesome. Um, well, anyway, uh, I was wondering if anybody in our audience had any questions. If you'd like to, um, just uh, unmute yourself and also nice if we can see you and ask away. Going once. <laughs> I don't really have any questions. Um, I'm the husband of the author that you're talking to today. Uh, so basically, I have the distinguished position of if I have any questions as to the hows and the whats, I could ask, I could ask the author directly. So it's kind of a, a great experience. <laughs> but for our benefit, what is something maybe you could tell us that she was wasn't going to tell us? <laughs> <laughs> she was yeah. pretty comprehensive. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I have anything to add to it. Well, fantastic then. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Not a problem. Oh, Hello. Mr. Ray's got a question. Yes. I have a question. Ray, hi. hi. Hello. Thank you. Hey, I really enjoyed listening so far. I learned a lot about like your process and stuff. That's really cool. Um, so I, I, I guess just a little intro. I've known Yin forever, I want to say. So um, it's nice to like see like you grow so much as a writer first of all. Um, and then second, um, I guess what my question would be, um, what, what advice would you have for people who are like struggling to start to write? Because like I have so many ideas in my head, you know, like, you know, the mind of a creator, you're just like, I want to write, I have this idea to do this, like, I'm already working on like a podcast, I want to write like a book or something. So I guess, what, 
what would be your advice for someone who wants to start writing but can never really you know nowadays there's no time for something you have to make time to do it so I guess what would be what was your how did you overcome that block if you had it and what would be your advice for someone who wants to start kind of that journey of either writing or creating like something like a podcast or a book like what would you be what would your advice be for someone who wants to start but can't seem to like find the courage to make the time <laughs> <laughs> um I know it's really scary because once you dedicate your time to something like that it's like, you know, writing and podcasting is so personal that you kind of have to see yourself through. So I guess my question is like, are you already recording the chaos? Like all these ideas mm -hmm. that you have, are you already like writing them down, like jotting them on notes in your phone? Yeah, okay, that's like, I, have like, I have like Google Docs and I'm just like, oh my God, I keep adding to them. But I'm like, when am I going to do it? Like, it's just, it's crazy. Um, well, I'm not going to lie. It does take some sacrifice. At some point, you are going to have to make that time and mm -hmm. not to do something else. But I think for me, what really helps is doing a technology cleanse um, mm -hmm. or, you know, as a, as a little kid, my parents didn't really give me a lot of screen time. That's primarily mm -hmm. why I started journaling. And then okay. as I got older, it's like, there really wasn't that much good stuff to watch on TV in the nineties. Like occasionally yeah. you went out to see movies. So yeah. it really was, I, I didn't have that many distractions and that's largely how I started writing. Um, but I, I think you you kind of already know based on what you said, it's like really needing to carve out that time, having to sacrifice something else that you want to do and not do that. And, right. you know, dog says I'm right. <laughs> I don't know if you heard my dog. <laughs> um, but I, I feel like Raymond, you're such a clever young man. You do not need my advice on this. I oh, think God. that <laughs> it's like, record the chaos get all the ideas down on paper and then ultimately you know it you just got to make that time and just sit down and just get everything organized think of it like like decluttering your closet or yeah. like you know cleaning your kitchen it's something that you, when you're living day to day obviously you have to do it because if you don't your house gets gross this right. you know nothing, nothing gets gross but it's the same process it's it's the cleaning up the ideas that you already have it's the decluttering and just getting everything down um and I think when I spoke with Jerry before like when I started writing Dynasty of Summer it was just ideas for fun I never intended to publish it but over time I took a look I'm like wow I'm like 80 to percent done and then mm -hmm. it's like do I want to just like keep this in my drawer forever or do I want to do I want to make the push and just finish it and it was about just cutting out that time and then just pushing through and finishing it and I want to thank you for the question Ray because I know that these things are on everybody's minds for anybody who wants to create something. And uh, and like you said, sometimes it's like casting a big net, mm -hmm. you haul it in, but then you got to go through it. Right. And I oh, want to yeah. also relate to things like closet cleaning and kitchen cleaning. I got to admit, I can't do that as a process. I got to be, it's got to be an event. Take yeah. care of it now. And maybe that's what like writing too. So people work differently and you just got to yeah. find the way it works for you, I guess. Yeah. And it's funny you guys mentioned that because I'm moving at the end of the, at the, end of the month and I'm, I've been cleaning out my closet while listening to this open. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, speaking to existence. But so, but yeah, I, I think that's a good, that's really good advice for me because, you know, it's like you said, there's a lot of distractions when it comes to technology. Cause I keep thinking about it. I'm like, wow, I just spent all this time just like scrolling through nothing. And so maybe I do that cleanse and just to allow myself to be creative rather than to just scroll. <laughs> so I, I do like that idea. So thank you. I'll probably have to do that soon. Yes. Thank you, Ray. I can't wait to see what you come up with. Yes. Oh, and I, I love your your like the book. Like I remember I told you already that I already got lost in like the first readings of it. I'm just like, oh my god, and I could still imagine everything very vividly. Um, so I mean like if I ever decide to like produce art, I'll be like, okay, what would this look like for me? So it's really cool. Oh. So I think you did a really good job so far with uh Dynasty of Summer. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, um, with that, we're probably running out of time here a bit. It's time to wrap things up. So did, oh, wait, I have somebody else. It's your sister, right? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, ask. Hi, and ask a question. <laughs> Hi, um, I wanted to ask, how do you name your characters? That's like something I struggle with all the time. And so I figured it'd be a good question to ask. 
Well, I mean, if you only know about Dynasty of Summer and the fact that I named them spring, summer, autumn, and winter, <laughs> maybe I might not be the best person to ask when it comes to naming characters. And um, the male lead in Dynasty of Summer is named Han Ming. His name literally means like great brightness, which isn't really creative or having brightness. Um, so when I was little, like around the time you were a baby, I came up with names by syllables that I think babies would like. <laughs> I took syllables that were pleasing and I smushed them together and I came up with names like Brigiani Takana. And then once I got older and they had baby books and Google, I would literally just pick a letter or a combination of letters that I like and I would just Google it. And then whatever struck out to me visually or you know, just the way that the name was sound is what I stuck with. And occasionally I still do take pleasing syllables and smush them together. I think that's how Toyota used to name their cars at one point. They had a computer oh, really? that did that, yes. <laughs> like like Corolla. Putting Cameron. syllables together, exactly, yes. Actually, I do have to confess that in, in the story I've been working on um, about the Rose Phoenix, uh, I would have to say a handful of the characters in there are named after tour guides that we've had in different countries. We have Alki, we have Hedden, we have Leovi, uh there's a few more but those were the they had some pretty cool names and i just kind of kept them in mm -hmm. my head so well thank you for your question jane um i think on the whole we've had a lot of fun tonight everybody here has gotten involved thank you and uh, did you have any parting words for our um, our audience about how we can um you know just I'm just looking forward to see what you have in store. I think you've, you have a lot in store, but what do you have to tell people again about what you do and, and how they can do it too? I think that, um, I, I, I really don't know what to say. I mean, thank you, obviously, number one. I think that if it's something that you really want to do, um, you're just gonna have to make time to do it. Uh, I have been very fortunate. And my husband's been really awesome in supporting me. He's allowed me to not work for quite a while and to focus on this. And it's not like I don't have anything to show for it. I've, uh, I've put out quite a few books. Um, the hardest part is the marketing. Uh, COVID has kind of hampered, like hampered that a little bit. It's a uh, hampered, sorry. As a writer, you always have to make sure you have the right word. If you don't, you can't move on. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that going out to book events, like putting yourself out there, having people know you as an author and to have them understand the type of writing that you do is very important. Um, you know, from like a marketing standpoint, make sure you create like a style, like an image and have that be who you are. Um, you know, just don't have blue hair one time and dress a little bit punky, which I can relate to. And then suddenly show up with like, I don't know, maybe platinum blonde hair and wearing a pantsuit. I, I think that uh, it might be fun if that's, if like, if changing outfits and styles is part of your image, but you have to really make sure that becomes your image, but to just have something cohesive, like having like a theme for all your books as well. So, you know, because readers, if they're not like diehard fans, they're probably going to confuse you with another author that you kind of remind them of. How do the, how do you stick in their head in other words? And some of those Yes, things exactly. Are... Like what is, what is your brand or what is the one thing that they can remember you? Brand by? you. So. Yes. yes. Uh, speaking of uh, events and in person, I believe you're going to be coming to see us on November 6th. Uh, yes. where we're going to have the uh, read write local number three i know you were at the last one we had or was mm -hmm. it the first one well, i don't know it was the last one i believe uh, two years ago so we're going to meet so. lots of authors that day we look forward to having you there and that you get to meet a lot of other authors as well so Definitely. Zoo, everybody thank you for joining us and thank uh, you and everybody have a great evening this has been read write local unbound i'm jerry vogel we'll be back with two more this summer we'll see you soon Take care. Bye-bye.